Welcome back, everyone, as we kick off the scientific component of the IFINS 2021 inaugural annual meeting. My name is Amy Preston. I'm the Senior Manager of R&D Regulatory, Nutrition, and Agile Innovation at the Hershey Company. I am also the co-chair of the Scientific Leadership Council. We are very excited to kick off today's meeting by welcoming Dr. Barbara Schneeman. Dr. Schneeman is currently Emeritus Professor of Nutrition at the University of California, Davis. As many of you are aware, she was also previously the Director of the Office of Nutrition, Labeling, and Dietary Supplements at the Food and Drug Administration and was chair of the most recent Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. She brings us extensive scientific, regulatory, and dietary guidance development experience to her keynote presentation today, Balancing Food and Medicine. Dr. Schneeman, we'll turn the platform over to you. Great, thank you, Amy, for that introduction. And thank you to iFINS for inviting me to give this presentation. So these are my disclosures. I'll give you a minute to look at that. So as I prepared this presentation, I began reading various papers and comments on the concept of food as medicine, with the question in my mind of whether a medical framework is the best way to think about food and its role in our health and well-being. The more I read, the more I began to think more in terms of balancing food and medicine. So why balancing? Medicine is commonly thought of in the context of treating or managing disease and various health conditions. However, as a nutritionist, I typically think of food as meeting nutrient needs, promoting health and well-being, and reducing risk of disease. In a sense, this is a role of a food, sort of food instead of medicine. And this need to balance a view of food as a major contributor to maintaining health and wellness, as well as being important in the management and treatment of disease, is evident in the four goals that were identified by NIH through its strategic plan and its initiative on per precision nutrition. In the four pillars identified by NIH, three of the questions to be addressed further our understanding of nutrition's function in maintaining health. What do we eat and how does it affect us? What and when should we eat? How, do, how does what we eat promote health across our lifespan? And the fourth question focuses on the importance of nutrition in management and treatment of disease. How can we improve the use of food as medicine? These initiatives reflect the challenges encountered through the process of developing the dietary guidelines for Americans. Traditionally, the guidelines have emphasized answers to the first question, and our knowledge has expanded from single nutrients to dietary patterns. The 2020 Advisory Committee examined the second question related to frequency of eating and found that evidence to make recommendations was limited or inadequate. Several research needs were highlighted in the future directions chapter of our report. The third question, impact across the lifespan, was identified as a central integrating theme by the 2020 Advisory Committee and in the 2020-2025 Dietary Guidelines. However, Overall evidence is limited in this area, and the need for longitudinal data is essential to move forward and strengthen. Again, that is also a part of the future directions identified. The fourth question is not within the scope of the dietary guidelines. Although numerous comments during the work of the committee identified this area as important, Successfully addressing this question of food as medicine in managing and treating disease may require some new thinking about policies related to foods and nutrition. So my interest in these areas is based on my background as an academic, as a scientist who worked at the interface of nutrition and food science, including the development of food-based dietary guidelines. And, but have, I have also had the experience of being involved with policy and regulatory development while I was at, at 
the, while I was at the Food and Drug Administration. So based on my experience, I see two tensions that need to be addressed and I wanna explore in this presentation about how we frame that relationship of food and medicine. The first tension relates to dietary patterns and these are the basis of food-based dietary guidelines and reflect our expanding understanding of the patterns most associated with reducing risk of chronic disease. However, our policy and reg framework tend to emphasize individual nutrients or food components, not how food groups are used in helpful patterns. The second tension relates to the evidence that indicates that we need to consider the role of nutrition, foods, and dietary patterns in the management of patients with disease. However, our current regulatory framework is narrowly defined and may be a barrier to innovation. So let's look at some background and why I'm focusing on these two tensions. In, um, recently, I published a paper based on lessons learned from my experience in the academic world and the government world. And as I started to work on this presentation, I reflected back on those lessons learned. First, science is necessary for developing, development of effective regulation and policy, but it's not sufficient. The other components include economic analysis, legal justification, and political will. In other words, the science may exist to justify some changes in regulation and policy, but it may not be enough without the economic, legal, and political will. Second, Understanding nutrition for health promotion and disease risk reduction focuses on prevention. Nutrition has a long history of demonstrating that specific nutrients based on their metabolic function can address major public health challenges. It began with the discovery of micronutrients. And at the end of the 20th century, CDC highlighted that addressing micronutrient deficiency was one of the public health achievements of the century, while noting the emerging challenge of obesity and chronic disease. The prevention strategies for diet-related chronic diseases present a much more complex picture. As we have learned many times over, including our recent experience with the pandemic, if prevention strategies are effective, how do we document something that did not happen and engage everyone who might be at risk to act? Also, how do we account for the cost of effective prevention strategies? Third, the interface between nutrition and public health includes food science and agriculture. We know that for the typical household, taste, cost, and convenience are drivers in food choice even in those households that also prioritize health and wellness. We can't view the food production and processing system as the enemy, but must consider how best to engage these sectors in making the typical food selections the healthful food choices. This point has been illustrated over multiple cycles of the dietary guidelines. Modeling healthful dietary patterns demonstrate that at least 85% of energy should be used for nutrient-dense food choices that meet nutrient requirements and food group recommendations, limiting the amount of energy available for added sugars, solid fats, and alcohol. But this pattern does not match the typical choices in the American diet, increasing the risk of excess energy intake and not meeting the recommendations. The challenge we face is shifting from what is typical now to the nutrient dense choice and food science has an important role. Fourth lesson, linking better foods to better health requires a multidiscipline strategy. The field of nutrition has its origins in chemistry, biochemistry, physiology, but now connects with medicine, psychology, behavioral sciences, economics and policy, communication science, among many other disciplines. And the challenge is often bringing the multidiscipline approaches together to develop more comprehensive strategies. 
that need for multidiscipline approach and thinking is evident in the NIH strategic plan. And then this fifth lesson is the one I want to focus more on in my presentation. So current policies and regulations actually delineate the role for foods in the health spectrum. And we have to ask, do we have the right framework? I, and I ask this question from two perspectives, one regarding how we approach food and nutrition recommendations for the general population, and the second, the potential role of foods and nutrition in disease management and treatment. Both aspects of this question are important in view of NIH's strategic goals to understand nutrition and health and well-being, as well as in the management of patients with disease. So let's look first at those issues for the general population. As indicated in this graphic, we started the 20th century with a primary focus on our understanding of the germ theory of disease in relation to food safety. The importance of nutrition emerged as we learned that food also provides essential nutrients. Atwater's early work emphasized the importance of energy, protein, and calcium, and even fiber or roughage as it was typically called, and emphasized a whole diet approach. This introduced the first efforts to make recommendations for food groups or food guides to provide advice on nutritionally adequate diets. With the introduction of the vitamin theory of disease, a new era of nutrition began. Because of the focus on micronutrients, Nutrition science became more reductionist in nature, and that reductionist approach is evident in the beginning of the RDA process, being able to define the amount of nutrient intake that could prevent deficiency. In many ways, this period of nutrition discovery and impact on public health followed a medical model. A deficiency disease could be treated by appropriate doses of the essential nutrient or nutrients. However, these medicines were parts of foods and must be consumed over a lifetime. In the 50s and 60s, as the awareness of dietary factors that contribute to certain chronic disease became more evident, um, that led to a new era. However, the connection between diet and chronic disease does not follow this simple model of micronutrients. Early work, and even today, there were many attempts to follow a reductionist approach, identifying food components such as certain fatty acids or carbohydrates that modify risk for chronic disease. But the diet-related chronic diseases are not single nutrient diseases. And social and behavioral elements are all, are all integral to the prevalence of diet-related chronic disease. So beginning in the 70s, the importance of food-based recommendations emerges to encompass the multiple factors that link food, nutrition, health, and disease risk reduction. So in a way, the field of nutrition illustrates this complex to simple cycle. Before knowing the nutrients and food components that are essential or beneficial, Various foods were encouraged as part of the eating pattern, that early Atwater advice. One might criticize this era as overemphasizing protein and energy to the detriment of fruit and vegetable consumption. However, once the discovery of vitamins and trace minerals began, we could target advice and become focused on specific compounds. However, in our current phase, we want nutrient adequacy, health and well being lowering risk of chronic disease, and the picture is more complex, encompassing all of these aspects. And new research is adding to this complexity, from the microbiome to understanding how genetic information enables us to personalize some nutrition recommendations. This is actually a poster from USDA that illustrates the trajectory we've been on and reflects a growing body of knowledge and understanding and the importance of embracing this complexity. Um, and we see that particularly in the last two cycles of the dietary guidelines. So for the 2020 advisory committee, 
we were asked to specifically examine evidence related to dietary patterns rather than to overfocus on single food groups, nutrients, or food components. To accomplish this task, we examined the relationship between dietary patterns and eight outcomes, as I've listed on this slide. After examining each outcome, the committee looked across these different systematic reviews to understand the common elements associated with reducing risk for chronic disease. So just to summarize some of what we put together, this table summarizes the grade assigned to the relationship between dietary patterns and each outcome. And you can see for all causes of mortality and cardiovascular disease, the grade was given as strong. For several outcomes, it was moderate and for a couple of the evidence was graded as limited. This table then summarizes the frequency of food groups across these various outcomes. And the focus was on the frequency and the patterns, not individual foods, and it allowed us to identify those common elements across dietary pattern, both for reducing risk with the green header as well as in those elements that were associated with increased risk in the um, under the kind of reddish header. So our summary across these outcomes then is reflected in the specific advice in the 2020-2025 dietary guidelines. So now my objective is to think about these factors in the context of the policy and regulatory environment in the US. So to do that, I thought it would be useful to take the graphic I showed earlier, but now ask how the regulatory environment fits with this progression of knowledge. So again, beginning in the 1900s, food safety was a driver and continues to be a driver, but I'm here to talk about nutrition. So with respect to nutrition, one of the early steps in using our knowledge of micronutrients was the implementation of food fortification standards, most of which still exist. Food fortification addressed several public health problems concerning several vitamins, iron, and the success of fortification programs, the most recent of which is folic acid fortification of cereal products, reaffirms the medical model of nutrition. And in this case, I think it might even be seen that food, that we use food instead of medicine, as long as the food was fortified. As diet-related chronic disease became the major cause of morbidity and mortality in the US, I think new approaches were needed and the era of food-based dietary guidelines was also a part of our thinking. So to encourage following the recommendations in the dietary guidelines, nutrition labeling became mandatory for most packaged foods through enactment of uh, the Nutrition Labeling and Education Act in 1990. I put the original nutrition facts, which was developed in response to the 1990 legislation. The legislation also authorized various types of nutrition-related claims on these products. However, Reflecting the priorities at that time, this approach is focused on individual nutrients and food components rather than, more, than the more comprehensive dietary patterns associated with health and well being currently emphasized in the guidelines. So the guidelines are released every five years. They've been released every five years since 1980. They've always included information on food groups to encourage and food groups to limit. However, earlier versions did tend to highlight food components. We can see the sugar, saturated fats, cholesterol, fiber in the overall guidelines. The 2010 advisory committee encouraged USDA and HHS to examine the role of dietary patterns, not just individual food groups and food components. And this effort became a focus of the process for the 2015 advisory committee. So for the 2020 advisory committee, the importance of dietary patterns is one of the integrating themes across all of the committee's work, including our 
examination of nutrient recommendations across various life stages. As illustrated earlier, by examining evidence across several outcomes, the advisory committee could identify the food categories that are consistently a part of helpful dietary patterns. So why do dietary patterns matter? This is a, a graphic that was developed by the advisory committee to try and illustrate our point. Foods are consumed in combination and it's the cumulative relationship that is important for health status. In addition, knowing the core elements of healthful patterns provides more flexibility for meeting individual needs and preferences. So the purpose of this graphic is to illustrate that continuing to focus on individual dietary components, um, for example, at that macronutrient and micronutrient level, is not useful if overall diet quality and dietary pattern is not factored into how, how guidelines are structured. So the concept of a healthful eating plan or diet quality has evolved from being defined by components to encompassing food groups and dietary patterns. And this is a key message from the work of the 2020 Advisory Committee. So what is the policy and regulatory framework we have to ensure consumers understand how various foods contribute to recommended food patterns. So for we have nutrient facts and related claims on food packaging for nutrient content or for the food components that reduce risk for chronic disease. Um, and these emphasize single nutrients or food components, not dietary patterns. We have several categories for such claims. However, for dietary patterns and meeting recommendations for food groups, currently individuals can examine an ingredient list. Although it may provide information, it is not quantitative information about food groups. A manufacturer can provide a statement about ingredient content, contains whole grains or vegetables. But the primary requirement is that such claims are truthful and not misleading, not that they reflect recommendations for a helpful pattern. So if I put this into the context of the diagram developed by our advisory committee, we have a regulatory framework relevant to diet quality at the level of the macro and the micronutrients. But I'm asking the question, are there criteria? How, what, how do we think about our regulatory and policy around dietary quality, how should that be reflected in policy? It's not a simple task. And I just, some of the challenges that need to be addressed, you know, the dietary patterns for the dietary guideline contain specific amounts of recommended food groups. What percentage of this recommended food group should a product contain to make a meaningful contribution to meeting recommendations? Are there criteria regarding nutrients or food components to limit or encourage for a claim regarding the product's contribution to meeting dietary guideline recommendations? In the current regulatory framework, the claim healthy was defined, but it is more of a nutrient-based definition. Should a food designated as healthy also contain a certain amount of a recommended food group? I know many of us are waiting for FDA's proposal. The dietary guidelines also refer to nutrient-dense foods as the foods to be used in healthful patterns. How do we ensure that the concept of nutrient-dense is used in a way to characterize products in a way that is truthful and not misleading? You may recall that one of my lessons learned is that food science and agriculture have an important role. And the food industry certainly is the master of taste, cost, and convenience and I think can bring that expertise to nutrient-dense foods. So just to shift then, the second aspect in that balance between food and medicine is to consider the function of food in the management and treatment of disease. And I, I'm gonna be basing my con comments on um, workshops organized by the National Academy of Science, which was sponsored by several government agencies and NGOs, and then a follow-up workshop that was organized by the Healthcare Nutrition 
Council. So as illustrated in question four in the NIH strategic plan, this area is critical to address, not only because of the prevalence of diet-related chronic diseases in the population, but also because of our growing knowledge of genetic and metabolic factors that can be related to nutritional status and influence nutrient requirements. Also, we see that the market is promoting many opportunities in this area from monitoring devices, diet books, self-health programs, other types of media that emphasize food as medicine. And it's important then to consider how the policy and regulatory framework needs to adapt. So our understanding of nutrition has encouraged us to think in terms of prevention, and that's certainly an appropriate and valuable role for nutrition, but we can't ignore the importance of food and nutrition in managing various conditions, especially in situations in which the metabolic, genetic, or physiological factors um, are involved. So my focus is not to analyze this area from the metabolic or physiology perspective, and I think we'll hear more from, about that from the panel but to ask questions of what fits in the regulatory framework and what might require some new thinking to realize the potential of this area. Just to remind you of the categories in the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, we have conventional foods, which include the typical foods and beverages, as well as dietary supplements consumed by the general population, and then foods for populations with disease or specific conditions which are classified as medical foods or foods for special dietary uses. And this just expands out some of the text as specified in law and regulation. And to me, it's really thinking about those two buckets, food and dietary supplements that are appropriate for the general population, and they're not intended to treat, cure, mitigate, or prevent disease or health conditions. And this is bucket is what we've been talking about in relation to the dietary guidelines. The bucket that includes foods that are appropriate for certain diseases or health-related conditions needs some consideration as well. And I've just put some text in bold to reflect some of the challenges in deciding what is appropriate in these categories and in meeting the needs of patients. So again, I felt the best way to look quickly at this area was to look at what was learned from the two workshops. So the National Academy, the NASM workshop, considered the role of nutrition in three categories, genetic diseases, tissue dysfunction and regeneration, and metabolic situations in which a nutrient can become conditionally essential. It's the report of a workshop, so there are no recommendations from NASM. But I have several observations about what was learned from the meeting. <clears throat> so the workshop illustrated several situations in which dietary reference intakes established for the general population may not be sufficient um, to, to meet the specific needs of various groups. Um, and sort of three categories, one in which we see that the nature of the disease involves the special nutrient requirements, and genetic disorders are the most common here, the inborn errors of metabolism, and sort of fit the traditional role of the way we think about medical foods. But we also discuss situations in which a consequence of the disease impacts nutritional status. And we looked at several types of bowel disease, which disrupt nutrient absorption and can create um, nutritional deficiencies. And then we also looked at situations in which the disease process itself results in an acute change. And often, we typically looked at these in several situations that involve trauma. So it's an acute period where nutrient requirements may be affected. So in other words, a special nutrient requirement can be the cause of disease, but it also can be the consequence of a disease or disorder. And as our understanding of the genetic and metabolic factors associated with disease increase, it's highly likely that our understanding of the potential role for food and nutrition will increase as well. 
So the healthcare nutrition workshop expanded the discussion beyond the focus of the NASM workshop to be more encompassing of various chronic disease conditions and also to examine the challenges from several perspectives, healthcare practitioners who are working to meet the special needs of patients, researchers who are investigating nutritional therapeutic approaches and often walking a fine line between what gets counted as a food and what gets counted as a drug. Manufacturers of these specialized products are also walking that fine line. In addition, organizations such as Aspen and AND who are developing clinical guidelines for medical nutrition therapy. And of course, the patients themselves who are trying to manage their health and economic status in the context of chronic disease and for whom modification of diet alone is likely to be difficult, especially in situations where a foods for special dietary use or a medical food could improve their quality of life. So by considering these various perspectives, the workshop illustrated the importance of establishing when a food or nutritional therapy can contribute to management or, of, or treatment of disease and disorders. However, important questions remain about research needs and the standards needed for reviewing evidence to establish nutrition, special nutritional requirements. Such standards are important for confidence in the approach, as well as practical issues such as third-party reimbursement. So from the NASM report, this table was presented by Patrick Stover simply to illustrate the importance of research for evidence to define special nutrition nutrient requirements using systematic reviews. And that's currently the approach to establish DRIs for the general population. So at the beginning of my presentation, I indicated that my objective was to examine these two tensions. The tensions can be healthy tensions if they result in new approaches and innovation in evidence-based strategies for meeting the nutritional needs of the general population, as well as for those who have special nutrient requirements. In this table, I've tried to put a very broad overview of factors influencing these tensions, the traditional role of nutrition in maintaining health is defined by the DRIs and used in the regulatory framework for nutrient content claims, structure function claims, additionally reducing risk of chronic disease linked to health claims. What is missing is guidance on how foods fit within recommended dietary patterns or meeting the dietary guideline recommendations for nutrient dense foods. That second tension is related to management of disease and the narrow definition currently in use and the lack of guidance on foods for special dietary use means that there are many challenges and potentially opportunities to address this area. So let me conclude then with some proposed principles that I hope can be a stimulus for discussion and perhaps challenge us to think of ways forward. Healthful eating patterns that are enjoyable and readily accessible depend on access to nutrient dense foods. And for the general population, such dietary patterns reflect food instead of medicine. However, for patients with certain chronic diseases or health conditions, their health and wellness is managed and maintained by access to appropriate foods and dietary patterns. So for certain chronic diseases, food is medicine. The healthcare system needs to support the development of evidence to enable access to this type of medicine for managing the needs of patients. And as research identifies the role of food in the management of patients with chronic disease, the policy and regulatory environment will need to evolve to support therapeutic nutrition. So I hope these proposed principles will spark some interesting discussion and um, encourage some thinking on these topics. Again, thank you for the opportunity to address the IFINS participants, and I look forward to your comments, questions, and the panel discussion later today.
Thank you, Dr. Schneeman, for sharing your perspective on this emerging topic. Uh, a lot of great information there, and I think a lot of great thought-provoking um, ideas. So we do have a few questions that have already started to come in. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and start with those, and please feel free to continue to type some questions uh, into the chat box as well. Um, so the one question that's come in is, what are the steps necessary to start the discussion of changing the regulatory framework for the allowing of food and diet in disease treatment? So the one example is, you know, the Mediterranean diet has already been shown to reduce clinically significant health outcomes in a lot of people. So in a sense, is that diet already starting to provide a drug effect? Right. So one of the challenges I, I know is the committee, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, looked across dietary patterns. One of the first things you find out is many studies refer to a Mediterranean diet pattern, but they're not all the same. So yeah. you need to have some criteria to, to judge dietary patterns. So in, in terms of thinking about where do we go with this, Obviously, starting the discussion is important, and the challenges that I, I mentioned are important challenges. You know, what is a meaningful amount? Um, you know, if you think about the way we put foods together, not all of your vegetables come from one serving of a food. So, but how much should you be able to provide? And also, you know, in the dietary guidelines and through the advisory committee report, there are descriptions of what is meant by nutrient dense foods. But that's another thing where do we need to start thinking about how should that be defined in regulation? Um, you know, the regulatory environment has many ways they can do this. They can convene listening groups. They can put out advance notices to ask questions. There, there are many ways that the, the government could start that process. I, I think groups like IFINS can also think about how, do, how would they want to contribute to that dialogue? Is there scientific information that would be useful to have to contribute to that dialogue? Yeah, and I know in, in your opinion, what would be really the first step towards shifting the regulatory systems towards the dietary pattern? You mentioned a lot of challenges, but are there any low hanging fruits that we might want to start with? Well, I, I think in, as I mentioned, we're all sort of waiting to see what FDA does with the definition of healthy, um, yeah. which might at least give us some insight into their current thinking uh, about that. Um, you know, perhaps low-hanging fruit is some discussion of how do you take the pattern concept in the dietary guideline and translate that into something that could be meaningful in terms of um, how information is provided to consumers on packaged goods, you know. How, how, how can consumers use information in packaging to help them relate to those types of recommendations? Yeah, sounds good. I'm going to shift gears a little bit because we're getting some other questions beyond regulatory questions. So another question that's come in is, as part of thinking about food as medicine, uh, should all physicians get more training in nutrition or should this be a specialty within each disease type? That, that's an incredible question. And I think we're gonna to touch on that in the, the panel a little bit because we specifically have clinical expertise coming into that, that panel discussion. And, and certainly that is one route is to make sure physicians have that as part of their training. Of course, the medical school curriculum is probably pretty dense already. Yeah. Um, and then we have groups like A&D, the um, Nutrition and Dietetic Academy, where as they move forward with medical nutrition therapy and the role that dietitians can play more generally in promoting health, 
you know, there's an opportunity through that route to have the kind of specific expertise that it's needed in professionals who can help consumers. Yes. Um, another question that's come in, um, could you expand upon the opportunities or limitations in the use of dietary guidance claims and statements and the use of supportive evidence for dietary patterns? Not sure I fully understand that, that question, but um, yes, yeah, so on food manufacturers currently can make a dietary guidance statement on a product. Um, and the, but there are no specific criteria that indicate um, this is how much of a food group you, you should have. You know, we've seen some um, non-government groups working in this area, for example, with whole grains, we've, we've seen, um, you know, the, the attempt to say, okay, how can you provide information on whole grains in a way that's meaningful to consumer in terms of trying to, to meet recommendations. So dietary guidance statements generally are regulated under that notion of truthful and not misleading, um, which, sort of leaves that question of, is there a minimal amount that you should have in order yeah. to, to make that kind of statement? Yeah, so maybe one of the limitations is it's not as clearly defined. Yeah. All right, um, another great question. The effect sizes of dietary measures versus medications in managing most chronic diseases are often rather small and yet these are rarely discussed. Um, do you know of any such sources, for example, statins plus dietary measures versus diet alone versus statins alone? That's an area that definitely needs in investigation. And I think the challenge in that kind of research is now you're looking at a four week period where the medication may be more effective in a short window of time. You know, that's one of the things that's so um, great about how the dietary guidelines now are taking this life stage approach and trying to understand what do helpful dietary choices mean over an entire lifespan. Um, and so the, the diet piece should be running for years and years and years, whereas the drug piece could run for a, for a shorter period of time. And, and our committee did identify, you know, we were really anxious to be able to look at how a diet early in life, a helpful pattern early in life might impact later outcomes. But we, we just don't have much in terms of longitudinal data that can really help us fully understand the importance of, of those connections. Another important area for future research. Yeah. All right, here's another uh, interesting question with a bit of a twist to it, a uh, different topic. You mentioned the importance of processed foods to meet the requirements. However, there's a lot of critiques of processed foods, especially highly processed foods. Um, how might we educate consumers about the appropriate use of processed versus raw foods? Yeah, the, I, I've seen that challenge in the, the dialogue that, that's out there. And um, with our advisory committee, we kept coming back to um, the evidence we saw focus more on limiting the amount of energy from added sugars, limiting um, sources of saturated fat. Um, the National Academy re DRI report on sodium, we, we didn't have to look at sodium with our advisory committee, but all of those factors. And again, that notion of nutrient dense food. If you look at the food pattern modeling part of what our committee did, that's where you see, you know, essential calories account for about 85% of the, the energy needs. So there's not a lot of room for, for these other food components. So to me, that's one dimension of the processed food is when is it taking consumers out of that nutrient dense food choice 
and into food choices that may overemphasize where those extra calories might be coming from. Um, when we're dealing with food processing that helps you meet those nutrient dense choices, you know, access to vegetables or fruits or whole grains that make those things more readily available. That I think can be more of a way where we see processing helping in yeah. meeting the nutrient dense dietary patterns that are considered in the, the guidelines. So yeah, I, I think the word process gets kind of misused um, in terms of understanding where in that spectrum we're, we're talking about processed food, but it, it is a communication challenge and it's an important one. Yeah, great point. So I know that you have got a lot of people thinking because there are lots more questions, but unfortunately this brings us to the end of our time. I know this is um, evidence that our panel discussion is going to be very interesting. So we wanna thank you again, Dr. Schneeman. Like I said, um, you'll be returning to explore this topic further in the next session. Um, so we will all be taking a short break until 12.30. And at that time, we will have a panel join us to really share their perspectives on this concept of food for health promotion and disease management. Um, hope you all have a great break and we'll see you in a couple minutes. Thank you. So welcome back everyone to this panel session, which will add some additional perspectives into the discussion about food for health promotion and for disease management. Today, we have an excellent panel of speakers, as you can see from this slide, and I'll introduce each of them as we move through the, the panel. So each panelist will be examining the concept of food for health maintenance and disease management from different points of view. We have four 10 minute presentations. And then after that presentation, we'll use some time for the panelists to interact and comment on each other's presentation and then open it up for audience um, Q and A. So our first presenter is Allison Yoder. Allison is the Nutrition in Food Retail Program Development Fellow through the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Foundation, leading the leveraging um, registered dietitians in the food retail environment to improve public health project. She is a leader in the health and wellness industry, having started her career working directly with customers in the retail setting and serving in many capacities at hy B Incorporated, including to supervise the retail dietitian program. Allison, welcome, and we'll turn the platform over to you. Thank you so much, Barbara. And as you mentioned earlier, I am a fellow through the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Foundation. I've been spending the last two years researching how to integrate food as medicine program models into food retail settings. Here are my disclosures for the presentation today. And as you can see here, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Foundation, we received a grant from Walmart in 2019 for a new project titled Leveraging Dietitians in the Food Retail Environment to Improve Public Health. So as a result of the Nutrition and Food Retail Program Development Fellowship was created. And for the past two years, um, I've been serving as the NFRPD Fellow, doing research and really looking at opportunities on how to integrate food as medicine interventions within current and future food retail nutrition programs. So through our research, we've developed a conceptual definition for food as medicine, We've identified pathways to intersect the role of registered dietitians within food retail settings, but we've also provided recommendations on how to integrate food as medicine programs within current and future retail nutrition models. So as part of my fellowship program, we assembled an expert advisory group. Uh, this was made up of 24 individuals who spanned diverse perspectives within both the food retail, but also the food as medicine professions. 
Uh, this ranged from retail, business, healthcare, community, and research and education. We had the advisory group convene at a two-day roundtable meeting in November in 2019 when we were still meeting in person to begin to determine how food retailers can implement a food as medicine concept within the food retail settings that utilize registered dietitians. So as a result of the roundtable meeting, the expert advisory group developed a conceptual definition for food as medicine. Uh, this has been approved by the Academy's Board of Directors and it's now included in the Academy's definition of terms. Uh, this conceptual definition is grounded in science to ultimately connect food to health in responsible and practical ways. And it does have distinct focus areas. Food as medicine to improve nutrition security and promote food safety. Food as medicine in disease management and treatment. Food as preventative medicine to encourage health and well being. So in addition to creating a conceptual definition for food as medicine, we also conducted a scoping review last year. And the scoping review analyzed the landscape of food retail nutrition programs, as well as food as medicine interventions. Uh, we really wanted to get a better idea of what types of programs were out there. And we also wanted to take a deeper dive to see which types of programs had an improvement in health outcomes while also producing a positive return on investment. The Retail Nutrition Programs and Outcomes Scope and Review was published last November, and you can find it in the Journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So within the context of the scope and review, five program model categories emerged. We have prescription programs, uh, this operates like a traditional prescription, allowing dietitians and other health professionals to prescribe subsidized food. We have incentive programs. Uh, this can range from providing coupons and vouchers uh, to discounted pricing on food categories, so fruits and vegetables, uh, rebates in the form of cash incentives and discount coupons, and then disincentives, such as taxes on certain food items. We have medically tailored nutrition. Uh, this really provides a more comprehensive therapy for patients who could benefit from improved nutrition. So with this model, a dietitian or another healthcare provider writes a prescription for the patient to receive tailored meals or boxes of food that align with a patient's health condition or diagnosis, such as diabetes. Our fourth program model is path to purchase marketing. This includes program models that are designed to produce behavior change as well as environmental change right at the location where selection of food for purchase occurs. And then our last program model is personalized nutrition education. Uh, this includes individualized approaches to health and well being that engage dietitians as well as nutrition resources directly with the customer. Uh, this can be done both in person and virtually, um, but also results in that positive behavior change. So the scope and review resulted in four key findings. Uh, first, we did find that food as medicine interventions and retail settings are shown to be successful. This is in producing either positive health outcomes or cost effectiveness as a single, single category intervention. Uh, path to purchase marketing, as well as incentive programs produce the most positive outcomes as standalone program models. And this was in terms of increased sales and revenue. Uh, but we did also find that personalized nutrition services also contributed in producing positive behavior changes. Uh, this was shown through healthier shopping purchases as well as improved eating habits. Our second key finding shows that both return on investment for the food retailer, as well as improved health outcomes for program participants, this was achieved when multiple category interventions were implemented. Studies that demonstrated the most effectiveness with producing both health outcomes, as well as return on investment, this included a combination of program models. So we have incentive programs, and this did include prescription programs and medically tailored meals when they were combined with an incentive program. We have personalized nutrition services and path to purchase marketing. 
So while several of these categories did produce positive outcomes as standalone program models, it's really important to note here that the greatest opportunity to integrate food as medicine with existing and future retail nutrition programs were shown through those multiple category program models. Our third key finding supported the foundation for which we built the conceptual definition from. Food as medicine interventions, as well as retail nutrition programs, encompass three different focus areas within that scoping review. Food as preventative medicine in the promotion of health and well-being, food as medicine in the management of chronic disease, and food as medicine to improve food and nutrition security. And then last, our last key finding found that dietitians are mostly involved in personalized nutrition education categories within retail settings. Uh, this is either as single strategy or those multi-component interventions. Uh, but we did see that dietitians are often utilized as part of an integrative team of professionals. So this could include physicians, nurses, pharmacists, and even chefs. So as a result of both the outcomes of the advisory group roundtable meetings, as well as key findings from the scoping review, a food as medicine retail nutrition framework was developed. So through this framework, services, programs, and promotions can be developed uh, to meet the unique needs of food retailers based on their current health and well-being priorities. So this framework can also be utilized across public health and healthcare programming as well to really serve as a guide for developing successful food as medicine programs with retail partners. So an example to provide, if you're developing a program to manage or treat diabetes, the food as medicine program models that are shown to produce the most effective outcomes were shown through prescription programs with an incentive included, personalized nutrition education, and medically tailored nutrition. So dietitians really should work with healthcare providers to develop a screening tool. This could be simply a diabetes diagnosis, or maybe there's other factors included, such as food insecurity. Uh, eligible patients could then receive a prescription for subsidized foods. Uh, this can be redeemed either as a single food purchase, or it can be through medically tailored meal boxes with a food retail partner. And then to really maximize the outcomes of the program, uh, dietitians or programs should consider pairing the food prescription with medical nutrition therapy or telenutrition visits with a registered dietitian. So this is just one example of what I provided, but as you can see, the combination of programs and incentives uh, truly are endless. So here I've just included my contact information and uh, please do not hesitate to reach out to me if you'd like to chat more about Food as Medicine and the Academy Foundation's fellowship program. Thank you. Great, thank you, Allison. Um, we're gonna <clears throat> move through each of the speakers before we open up for, for discussion. So our next speaker will be Dr. Sharon Donovan. Um, Dr. Donovan's laboratory at the University of Illinois focuses on pediatric nutrition with an emphasis on nutrition and gut microbiome, immune and cognitive development in infants. She has served as president of several professional organizations, including ASN, is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and served on the 2020 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. In July 2020, she was named as the inaugural director of the Personalized Nutrition Initiative at the University of Illinois. And today she will share her insight from the perspective of research on personalized nutrition. Sharon? Oh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And it's really my pleasure to discuss today where we are with predicting personalized responses to food. And these are my disclosures for this presentation. And I'd like to start with placing personalized nutrition within a continu continuum of nutrition, starting with general pub public health nutrition, targeting the general population, and a good example being the dietary guidelines. The next level would be looking at nutrition for specific groups, such as clinical populations or infant pregnant women and the elderly. And so these could be age or state or disease specific recommendations. 
And then lastly, we have this concept of personalized nutrition, where nutrition is being much more tailored to the unique um, factors affecting that individual. And we'll talk about what some of those are. So we're really taking into context individualized characteristics. So the, the key aspect of personalized nutrition is this recognition that humans are inherently different from one another and can respond differently to similar dietary inputs. And we've, we've known this for many years. I mean, clearly the concept of nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics has been recognized for over 20 years. But we've also found that simply focusing on genetics is not really sufficient to explain this in, inter-individual variability. So when we think about personalized nutrition, it's really a broad tent that's encompassing a wide array of features, not only genetics, epigenetics, microbiome, metabolome, proteome, you know, name your own, but also the concept of when are we eating, what are we eating, what are our eating patterns, what's our inherent health status, and then also putting us within a broader socioeconomic and psychosocial characteristics, our food environments and physical activity. So you can see that as we move towards more personalized nutrition, we're really going to be needing to collect a lot of information. So there is no generally accepted definition of personalized nutrition. Um, however, I wanted to highlight that OC North America, now IFEN's expert group, proposed the following definition. So this is that personalized nutrition uses individual specific information founded in evidence-based science to promote dietary behavior change that may result in measurable health benefits. So you can see what I've highlighted. And I really think the key factor for us to think about throughout this process is the need for evidence-based science and measurable health benefits. And that needs to be supported by dietary um, behavioral change. Also in this paper, they propose 10 um, guiding principles for design and implementation of personalized nutrition. So again, key, I think as Allison talked about, you know, looking at your users and beneficiaries, but again, throughout the process, um, using validated tools, using data-driven algorithms, and, and towards the end, also making sure that you're protecting individual data privacy and responsibility. And, and so we can think about this personalized nutrition pipeline, starting with discovery research through robust clinical testing with adequate and diverse populations. And then ultimately, the trend has been to move that towards commercialization. So where are we? Can we predict personalized responses to food? And I'm, there's a number of large studies out there. I'm just going to be summarizing um, two of the, the main studies. But I think it really provided this proof of concept that when we combine genetic, phenotypic, microbiome, and lifestyle factors, we can generate predictive algorithms that perform better than any, any one individual predictor. So the, the first is the ZV study, which again is now six years old from the um, Weizmann Institute in Israel. Um, I also wanted to mention that the algorithm developed in Israel was subsequently tested in populations and in collaboration with the Mayo Clinic, and I'll just touch on that. And then there's the PREDICT trial, um, PREDICT1 and, and PREDICT2, which um, in addition to doing postprandial glycemic response, added insulin and triglycerides as well. So the next two slides are really, I just wanted to highlight the fact that these are incredibly labor-intensive types of studies to do, but this is the type of evidence that we need. So in the case of the ZV study, they had um, 800 in their original cohort in between 18 and 70, 60% female, um, most overweight or obese, although none of them were had been diagnosed as diabetic. So they collected a lot of um, per-person profiling from microbiome, blood test questionnaires, anthropometrics. They did very intensive testing. So you can see for their diaries, they had over 5,000 days, nearly 50,000 meals. They had 1.6 million glucose measurements. And so this is something to really collect the evidence we need to, to commit 
to these types of studies. And so they had a main cohort, which they used to develop their AI algorithm, which they then tested in a validation cohort, and then a much smaller dietary intervention. The PREDICT-1 trial, again, this was about 1,000 subjects in the UK. And it's important to note that some of these were also twins, and so they were more genetically related, and then a validation cohort in the U.S. Again, very intensive sampling, um, both in baseline and in the home phase. Um, in addition, they added um, triglycerides and C-peptides, but you can see, again, over 2 million continuous glucose monitoring readings and over 28,000 um, triglycerides and C-peptide assays, et cetera. So the, the key findings of these studies kind of what I say is the take-home messages. So then in both studies, there was large inter-individual variability in the postprandial responses to glucose and also in triglycerides and insulin in the PREDICT study. Postprandial glycemic prediction in both studies um, was around the same, about 0.68 and 0.77. And um, it's important to note that for glycemic response, the prediction is better, more accurate than for um, triglycerides and insulin. In the um, DB study where they actually did an intervention where they compared a diet um, sort of prescribed by the, the machine learning algorithm versus a dietitian, they found that the predicted response um, was better in the diet that had been designed by the um, algorithm than by the registered dietitian in terms of predicting how they would how their glycemic would response would be to um, a meal. And then um, the last factor is that when we look at what predictive factors were coming in, it varied by the outcome. So actually in both studies, microbiome has been identified as a key factor. Um, in regulating the postprandial response. But in the PREDICT trial, they were able to compare triglycerides, glycemic response, and insulin, and they were able to show that microbiome, this is the percent of variance explained by microbiome characteristics, was some, somewhat similar. Whereas when they looked at genetics, it was really only for the postprandial glycemic response that genetics was accounting for about 9. 5% of the variance, whereas for triglycerides and insulin, it was a very small component. So I think that as we look at these large trials, I mean, there is emerging evidence that supports the promise of developing personalized nutrition recommendations. And we are seeing continually on the market increased availability of commercial services and products that will drive innovation, but I'll always come back to we need to make sure that we have that strong evidence base to support any type of product that is being marketed, particularly to the lay public. And that there still is significant challenges as well as opportunities that exist, and that the evidence base really is still limited. But as we look at this pipeline, I would say that in some of the two examples that I've given, they've already seen that they've gone through the full pipeline to. Um, the ZV study resulting in day two and the PREDICT trial in ZOE. So again, we do have some proof, proof of concept. So what do I see as some of the challenges? Again, the cost of conducting these large trials and the, and the expense of these multi-omic analyses. So we do need the research funding. And, and this is why in some cases it's being driven by commercialization to get that return on investment. But as I'll mention, um, there are governments, both EU and, and U.S., that are making um, research commitments. I think a key thing is we need to increase the diversity of the participants, and that so far most of these studies have been um, conducted in, in very homogeneous populations. We need um, – the, the collection is very data-intensive and so far has only used selective um, outcomes. We need to develop more predictive biomarkers, um, not only on the input side, but also as we're assessing outcomes. Um, data collection, again, there's needs. We're still very dependent on self-report, particularly of dietary intake. And there's really limited options for continuous monitoring, such as for glucose or exercise. So the area of personal technologies and devices that address these biomarkers that we're um, identifying as being predictive. 
And then lastly, the, the data analysis challenge, you know, we need to develop rigorous and validated algorithms. And this is really going to involve very transdisciplinary collaborations with data scientists. So what are some of the opportunities? Um, I think most of us are probably aware that the NIH strategic plan issued in May of 2020 put precision nutrition right at the center of the um, nutrition strategy for the next decade. This is followed up by an NIH common fund, the investment of $156 million to set up the Nutrition for Precision Health Consortium, which will build upon the All of Us Research Program, which is ideally will have um, a million very diverse participants. So to conclude, um, again, I believe that scientific, clinical, and consumer interest in the promise remains high. And that while many services and products are emerging, the current evidence base is still limited. But I do think that the NIH um, Nutrition for Precision Health Consortium, as well as other um, efforts internationally, will um, bring more evidence to the table. And, and hopefully in the next five to 10 years, we'll begin to see greater promise. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Donovan. Um, our third perspective comes from Dr. Jamie Ard also a member of the 2020 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. And Dr. Ard co-directs the Wake Forest Baptist Health Weight Management Center and is a clinical researcher focused on studying strategies to treat obesity in adults. He has served on several committees for the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, including the current Standing Committee on Evidence Synthesis and Communication in Diet and Chronic Disease Relationships. He's also a member of the Food and Nutrition Board and serves as an advisor for the IFIN Sodium Committee. Um, Dr. Arg works directly with patients and will be offering comments from that perspective. Jamie? Thank you, Barbara. So I'll talk about what does this idea of food for health maintenance and disease management mean for individuals who practice medicine. Here are my disclosures. So just a bit about me to help inform the perspective that you're going to hear. Um, I am a traditionally trained uh, physician, trained at a you know medical school here in the U.S., completed a residency in internal medicine, uh, focused on primary care actually, and uh, completed a health services uh, research fellowship. Following that, uh, again, focused on primary care, but also really looking at outcomes related to nutrition and behavioral health, um, especially in the setting of type two diabetes, as well as hypertension. I went on to academic uh, medical centers, faculty positions in, in departments of nutrition and si nutrition sciences and epidemiology and prevention. And along those uh, faculty positions, I primarily uh, did research, but also practice medicine in the weight management space as a, a specialist in obesity treatment for adults. So that informs my practice uh, and my perspective. And when I think about food uh, in the space of a medical setting, there are several challenges that I think that are apparent. So our current model of care is one where a provider like myself um, fulfills a few different roles as a diagnostician, right? So you come in with a complaint, I take a look at that complaint and the history and the labs, and I try to figure out what is that complaint and give you a satisfactory answer. And then based on that uh, diagnostics, I then turn around and prescribe some treatment plan. Um, and if that requires additional support or care, I then serve as a care coordinator, um, but also have you come back for follow-up to ensure that the treatment plan has worked. So that in a very simple nutshell is, is sort of the current model of care. Now, if we think about what what does that model of care allow for and, and what do we train physicians like myself to be you know efficient and proficient with in that type of setting well brief counseling right in a continuity setting um, the five a's is what we hear about a lot substance abuse counseling smoking cessation being able to help people sort of make some changes in their lifestyle 
um, using some really brief and con uh, concise interventions. Um, acute disease treatment. So if you come in with a certain set of symptoms, either to urgent care or into the office and you complain of um, dysuria and lower back pain, then I think, okay, that's a UTI and I need to treat that. Um, or chronic disease management like type 2 diabetes or hypertension. I know how to you know, treat those to go with an A1C less than 7 or a blood pressure less than 120 over 80. Um, or preventive services like knowing, okay, you hit this benchmark, this milestone, uh, this stage of life, you need this vaccine or you need to get these screenings in terms of preventive services. Those are the things that we often um, want our primary care providers to be really efficient with, to be really good at, and it takes a fair amount of time to be able to do that and do that well. Um, <clears throat> now, if we're going to add food to the mix as a part of the disease management process and health maintenance uh, process, um, I would argue that we, our current system is a fundamentally uh, unfit system for um, being able to utilize the skill set um, and the roles that uh, individuals in the current healthcare system really sort of can play. And I'm talking about physicians here again. So um, one, there's limited education, two, their time pressures, and three, ownership to me would be unclear. And so let me just sort of explain what I mean by these three points. So in terms of limited education, I think this one is pretty straightforward. Less than 1% of lecture hours in medical schools are spent on nutrition education. I am on a panel with some very esteemed dietitians. These are the folks who get all the nutrition education in our healthcare system, um, not healthcare providers, not even our um, APPs, our advanced practice uh, partners like um, uh, nurse practitioners or uh, uh, physician assistants. Um, the the amount of nutrition education that we get in our training is um, really poor. So the the fact is when we give advice that you should ask your doctor about the best diet to follow, um, it would be interesting to know where your doctor is getting their advice from because in my guess, in my estimation, it's not based on the education that they got in their medical school training or their residency training. It's likely based on some facts that they got from the internet just like you did. Um, there's also a limited amount of time in a primary care setting where the average office visit is going to be 15 minutes or less. Um, and in that time, the primary care provider is expected to address a whole host of issues from preventative care to changes in your health status, new complaints that have come up in the meantime, and then coordinate care, order tests, prescribe medicines, renew medicines, and then develop a follow-up plan. And that's all supposed to happen in the course of a 15-minute visit. So it's no wonder that physicians often interrupt patients with less than two minutes into an office visit to start driving the agenda because they are so rushed and time pressured to try to check off all of these boxes and complete what is deemed a reasonable visit. The last one I think that's a challenge is the idea of ownership. Who really takes the lead here if we're talking about food as medicine, food as medicine? Um, given the scope of the issue, right, everybody eats. Everyone is at risk for chronic disease. Everyone could benefit from health maintenance. Primary care providers are on the front line and would be um, you know, best situated, you know, from a stamp from the standpoint of being gatekeepers of healthcare. But um, with all these limitations that I've just talked about, especially the the training and the time pressures, you, you'd have to, you know, wonder is that a reasonable expectation? So you might have someone in that place, but they are ill suited for the role. So the question really, I think, is should physicians be on the food as medicine team? Um, and I think it's an ideal situation to imagine that we could do that, but I think in order to do that, some things will have to, will have to change. Um, and so, you know, a couple of different thoughts. At the provider level, certainly we need to have an increased nutrition education presence for medical providers. Um, and at the healthcare system level, we need to start reimbursement for, for the time spent counseling. We need to think about resources for provision and preparation of food. Um, so if I were to redefine what that physician role might look like, then 
you know, it might be a diagnostic process. So if you take what Dr. Donovan just talked about and say, okay, if I can use some type of predictive panel to, to identify the best food pattern for you, can I, can I order that test? And then when I get that test result back, can I then put in an order in my EMR that says this patient needs this dietary pattern and that gets fulfilled at a participating grocer? The same way when I put in a prescription for your antibiotic for your urinary tract infection, it gets fulfilled at a, a local pharmacy of your choice. And then what we would do on the back end is coordinate with other professionals in this space to really sort of help bring skills and other resources to help you adequately or appropriately utilize the prescription. So in summary, I think food as medicine is something that has tremendous potential and the early data from some of the studies that are being done are really intriguing. Um, but healthcare practitioners in our current system you know, including physicians, we are just ill-equipped to really play, submit, I think, a substantial role on this team. And we need better nutrition education and medical training in order to be able to uh, participate actively. And there have to be other system levels change, system level changes um, in order for us to really sort of think about how we operationalize this. And then ultimately, I think if we decide, yes, healthcare practitioners are going to be in this game and part of the team, then we need to clarify those roles and, uh, and actually align us incentives in order to really help um, support the behavior that we want to see from the providers. Because um, I, I can guarantee you that the, the behaviors will follow the incentives. Um, so thank you for your time. Great. Um, thank you, Dr. Ard, for that presentation. So our final perspective for the panel is Dr. Bridget Wojak. And Bridget is the Director of Nutrition for the Kroger Company, through which she elevates a personalized approach to eating and enjoying food. In this role, she sets nutrition strategy and manages Kroger's in-store and corporate dietitian teams, among other duties. In 2018, she received the Supermarket Dietitian of the Year Award from the Produce for Better Health Foundation. And she will offer a perspective coming from that retail grocery environment. So Bridget. All right. Everyone, I'm Bridget Wojak. I'm the Director of Nutrition at Kroger, specifically Kroger Health, and I'm here to offer a retail perspective on food as medicine. Here are my disclosures. At Kroger, we have a specific take on food as medicine. You'll find the words food as medicine or food is medicine often has a very broad interpretation depending on the setting of utilization. We choose to interpret this phrase to mean a dedicated, educated, and personalized approach to eating and enjoying food so we can live healthier lives and prevent illness before it even starts. Emphasis on the enjoying food because we're a grocery store and we feel like it should be a food playground, not somewhere that's scary and difficult to navigate. Not everyone realizes that the grocery store can be the nexus of healthcare and your everyday life and an accessible point to better your health. At Kroger Health, we have over 22,000 healthcare practitioners. We service over 35 states and over 14 million customers. The reach of the retail grocer is broad and accessible. We know that patients are starting to look at grocery stores to help them eat healthier foods. Think of the thousands of decisions that occur in a retail setting every day. There's large amounts of dietary guidance available, and we know that many people don't understand it and or don't utilize it. If we can provide support at the point of the decision and keep the person in personalized nutrition, retail medical nutrition therapy administered by a registered dietitian can be key to improving public health outcomes. Let's talk numbers for a second. Any one grocery store, depending on the size, might have between 40,000 or over 100,000 products to choose from. 
That is a lot of decisions to be made. How are we equipping people to make those decisions? Well, every household typically has a primary shopper, the person who's buying the groceries and potentially preparing the meals. Let's say this person grocery shops once a week. Perhaps they like to spend a longer time in the store and really take their time sifting through products. We'll assume they spend an hour. That's about 50-ish hours a week, or sorry, 50 hours a year in the grocery store setting compared to a retail clinical dietitian at Kroger Health who over the course of their time with Kroger on average has spent somewhere between 6,000 and 8,000 hours working one-on-one -on -one in the aisles of a grocery store to share their clinical nutrition expertise with shoppers. This is where we equip our shoppers with the resources they need to be successful by giving them a human to hear their personal and emotional side to their food story, in addition to giving them sound clinical guidance. How that guidance is given is critical to patient success. Generally speaking, many adults have a fundamental understanding that they need to eat better, perhaps more fruits and vegetables, and move their bodies more often through physical activity. Knowing does not equal doing. So how do we get people to activate? How do we get them to do what they're supposed to do to maintain their health? In addition to providing resources, we make sure that those resources are provided in a human way. When a registered dietitian is administering medical nutrition therapy or one-on-one -on -one nutrition counseling in a retail setting, the guidance is understanding, compassionate, empathetic. It is very personalized. This is the part where you hear deeply about someone's story. Are they a single mother shopping for three children, one who has a food allergy, one who's an extremely picky eater, and one who's trying to make it to sports practice after school? Do they like to cook? Do they not like to cook? How did someone speak to them about their own relationship with food when they were a child? This is how personalized medical nutrition therapy gets. The advice that is given is pragmatic. It has to be easy to implement. Telling that same patient, who has three children that they need to cook from scratch three meals a day for their family to keep them healthy is not a realistic option. That's why the advice given at the product level in retail is always very solution oriented. Rather than saying, you should try more whole grains, the recommendation is going to say, you should try 90 second microwavable whole grain brown rice. Here it is, put it in your basket. I'm gonna recommend three other items that you can combine it with and have an easy meal that you can modulate depending on how picky each of the children is and get everybody something that they'll eat quickly that's nourishing. That's how we give personalized care. I wanna talk a little bit more about medical nutrition therapy and its evidence-based cost-effective nature. Medical nutrition therapy has been helpful in the prevention and delay of chronic disease and conditions. It should be viewed as a tool to close the gap between dietary guidelines, the science, and human behavior, the art. In addition to helping manage conditions, it's also helpful to maintain health. Oftentimes folks will hear the word medical nutrition therapy, and it feels a little intimidating. It has the word medical right in it. It can also be used for prevention and maintenance in addition to getting condition specific. And consider that medical nutrition therapy does keep the person in personalized nutrition by understanding that a household typically accommodates different food preferences. So when a registered dietitian is providing medical nutrition therapy in a retail setting, whether that be in the grocery store or via two-way video chat, teaching someone how to shop online using e-commerce, that advice can take into account the eating preferences of the entire household. Perhaps the patient is working on managing their diabetes, but they also buy groceries for a spouse who has high blood pressure and a gluten intolerance. We need to make sure that the recommendations that we're giving accommodate not just the patient, but their community as well. We know that this is the best way to get them to stick to the advice that's given, in addition to getting them to trust their medical provider. MNT has been shown to decrease hemoglobin A1C and improve lipid panel. We can see improved metrics in terms of 
biometric markers, and also self-efficacy and patient-reported rapport with a clinician. Let's get a little bit more specific. We've said that medical nutrition therapy in a retail setting can provide pragmatic, specific, personalized solutions. So general nutrition guidance may say something along the lines of, include a lean protein at meals and snacks for satiety, make sure to get a variety of protein sources. Is that sound advice? Certainly. If I were to put someone with limited nutrition education or a limited nutrition background into a grocery store and say, go ahead, find me lean proteins for meals and snacks, get a variety of sources, we're not giving them the resources that they need to be successful and it still feels intimidating. In my career as a retail dietitian, formerly I worked with patients one-on-one -on -one in our stores. It was not uncommon to have a patient come in with educational handouts from the hospital and say, they gave me these papers, I don't know what they mean. I'm very intimidated, I just feel really overwhelmed. This is the part where medical nutrition therapy in a grocery store setting is the rubber meeting the road. So we take that recommendation to get a lean protein at meals and snacks and we start talking about products. Okay, you need to make sure that you're getting an adequate amount of protein. Let me give you a recommendation for how much protein you might need in a day based on your age, weight, lifestyle, and medical conditions. Let me take into account your food budget and then let me know what foods do you like and what foods are you not willing to touch. Many adults get turned off by the idea of hearing the word dietitian or the thought of working with a dietitian because they think you're going to make me eat salad. You're going to make me eat lettuce. That might not be the case. We don't have to force you to eat foods that you don't want to eat. We can give a product recommendation that will say, this product has eight grams of protein. I know you like it. It meets your budget. Have this product for lunch. Have a separate product for dinner. We'll also tell you which ones are complete and incomplete proteins and the products that you need to pair them with to make sure that it's just easy to to implement the advice. Our clinicians know science. We need to make sure our patients know how to action. Understanding personalized nutrition in the retail setting includes understanding all aspects of lifestyle in addition to the clinical pain points. What is the patient trying to solve? Well, clinically, they might come to you and say, oh, my doctor said my calcium is low, I'm chronically dehydrated, and I need help managing my blood sugar because I have diabetes. Well, it might be easy to say, okay, Try a low-fat milk option. I know you're a chronic soda drinker. I would like you to switch to flavored water. I know you like sweet tea. How about some unsweet tea? Those are all valid recommendations. If you look at the top portion of this slide, you'll see those recommendations are great until the patient reveals, well, I'm elderly. I have bone density problems. I'm not very strong. I struggle to pick up heavy things, and I live on the third floor. I take the bus to get here. Suddenly, those clinically accurate recommendations are not pragmatic for that person. That's where we recommend the products on the bottom. Try a single serving yogurt for calcium, some flavor packets for a sugar-free beverage. And I know you really love tea, so I'm gonna recommend these teas that brew well to make an iced version without the added sugar. This is where we give clinically accurate advice that accounts for budget, taste preferences, and lifestyle. I'm looking forward to the panel discussion and engaging with the audience. Thank you guys. Great, thank you everyone for sharing these perspectives on this concept of food for promoting health and managing disease. Really some excellent presentations. So yeah, if, if all of you could get your webcams on. Um, I, I do have to say though that listening to these perspectives, the comments really indicate to me that we're certainly beginning to more fully understand the potential for personalizing nutrition related to maintaining health and managing disease, but that understanding is also revealing what will be necessary to fully move this area forward from the nature of the data and the research, the expertise of healthcare providers, and what individuals encounter when they're purchasing and preparing foods. It sort of covers across all of these. And I have to admit, I was also struck by the fact that Many of us see our healthcare provider maybe once or twice a year, but we're probably in our grocery store about once a week. Um, and that may be where more of the contact happens. So how should that be impacting the way we think about food in relation to, to medicine? So um, 
we've had a lot of questions coming in, and so I'm just trying to keep track of them. So I, I'm going to just go through and, and try to hit on some of these questions. I don't know that we'll be able to get to all of them, but um, let, let me start out by um, maybe asking Bridget and Allison if you could comment on, there was a question about promoting um, well-being through dietary choices among teens or households with teens. Are, are there efforts around that particular group as well? I would go off of exactly what, what Bridget was talking about within her presentation with the personalized approach to medical nutrition therapy that dietitians take within the food retail setting. There, there truly is an opportunity to, to tailor to the specific needs of all individuals, whether those be the adults or the food purchase decision makers within the household, um, but it also entails to the entire family. And so how can we start to take those personalized approaches with children as well as teens to meet their truly growing needs? And um, especially as you get into the teen years, um, you know, what services are available that dietitians provide within food retail settings, whether that be in the store or virtually, to begin to provide cooking skills and other knowledge and training for individuals of all ages so they can truly excel in grocery shopping and eating uh, healthy eating pattern that, that is best for them. I so, yeah, agree. well, I was going to say, Bridget, as you comment, also thinking about how some of the things you've talked about um, are come into play in food service and restaurants, you know, other kinds of settings other than that typical grocery store. So whether medical nutrition therapy is administered in an outpatient setting or a retail setting, it becomes pragmatic to other places that people will choose to eat, whether it be at their home, at school, at a restaurant, specifically when you're talking to groups of teenagers, because it's such an important developmental phase. Medical nutrition therapy is an excellent opportunity to make sure that they're involved in their own decision making around food. Lots of times during teenage years, they want to start making independent decisions and they're striving for independence. And the idea of a medical nutrition therapy intervention, so working with them one on one about their food choices, allows them to start acting on the advice that they're getting right away. So a restaurant is a great example. You're maybe not necessarily buying those groceries or preparing them, but based on what you've learned working one on one with a dietitian, you can action on what you were taught. It's also a really important time to engage in a nutrition intervention because Teenagers are on the cusp of becoming independent in their own food environment and learning to cook, shop, and prepare foods for themselves. So it's a very important time for nutrition intervention. Great, thanks. Um, so Sharon, I'm gonna turn to you. And um, one part of my question for you, um, just to get you to comment on the terminology, um, precision medicine, personalized medicine, are these the same thing or, or different? But the, the bigger question is, you know, because of physiology, things like the gut microbiome and, uh, gut microbiome and other things that change over time, it seems like a prescription approach could work short term um, and then may require some iteration in terms of updates and periodic testing. You know, how, how does that yeah. fit into this whole picture as we try to personalize more? Right. So in terms of definition, you know, NIH has gone with precision nutrition as opposed to personalized nutrition and, and thinking about that personalized nutrition is actually a component of precision nutrition. I mean, personally, with our program in Illinois, I've gone with personalized nutrition because when I think about precision nutrition, to me, that speaks more to sort of analytical precision. But, you know, precision nutrition is the definition of the name that NIH is going, going with. Um, in terms of, you know, I was just thinking about some of the things that Bridget was talking about, and I can tell you we have no evidence right now of any of the types of studies I talked about in children. I mean, almost everything is done in middle-aged to older individuals. So if we really want to understand, you know, how personalized nutrition from a genetic, epigenetic, microbiome perspective, you know, we need to have the work at those ages. And I think that when I think about this in two ways, and I think this 
I do believe, you know, if you look at the evidence, it does have promise. And it's clearly the, the data, particularly, you know, from the ZV study showed that you can give two individual, individuals bread or bread and a donut or bread and sugar, and you're going to see different responses. And so I do think that, you know, there is the promise there. But I've also, the reason in my talk why I kind of set up the three levels, I don't think that we kind of throw a hundred years of, you know, nutrition research out the window. And as we know from the dietary guidelines, that people are already so far, you know, from eating a healthy dietary pattern that I think that if we can start to, to press on those points, you know, in terms of more fruits and vegetables, healthier, you know, um, less dietary fat, things like that, and then go to, okay, um, you know, so maybe Jamie sees somebody and I've seen this, you know, when we work from Pennington, so you put someone on a, a diet, you know, a low fat diet, and suddenly their cholesterol doesn't change or their cholesterol actually goes up. And we know that that's related to SNPs. And so we can begin to get into the personalization rather than just assuming they're not following the diet. But I do think that in the meantime, while we're collecting this data, that we should be able to give, you know, solid nutrition advice, you know, based on, you know, the evidence that's there. And for example, what's been, was reviewed in the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. Um, so I'll just say one thing. So, you know, somebody's genetics is not going to change. Their epigenetics is not going to change that quickly. But if we're doing a microbiome, if you intervene on someone with a diet, you're going to need to measure their microbiome, you know, often. Because <laughs> it's going to change within several days. And so we should almost think about microbiome frequency similar to a clinical measure frequency. If you really, you know, want to if you're going to measure hemoglobin A1C or, you know, over a period of time. So that is going to change. And then, as we know, that could change your output. So that will need a little bit more evidence around it. Right. And actually, you're, you're reminding me that um, we often think of these terms of genetics and metabolism, but Bridget, I think, gave us many other examples of how you have to personalize the approach for the the individual. So Jamie, we also have a, a question here about research looking at the impact of nutrition on mental health. And um, I, I'm, do you have some comments on that of sort of that psychological benefits that people associate with health and just what you've experienced working with uh, as a clinician? Yeah, so I think this is a really important area for discussion because um, there are two different, you know, sort of ways of thinking about it. So one is um, a healthy diet and its association with feelings of wellness and and quality of life. And you know, we know those quality of life domains that we often measure include um, aspects of mental health. And you know, there's you know plenty of data to show. Um, changing a dietary pattern will improve quality of life. And within those domains, you see, you know, similar improvements across both mental and physical health uh, domains. So, yes, there, there's definitely evidence to support that, you know, a higher quality diet can be associated with uh, better mental health status. The, the other side of this, though, that I see often clinically is this sort of biobehavioral interaction between the food we eat and the way we feel um, and, and, and how that then drives subsequent food choices, right? So um, if I am consuming a diet that is repetitively high in, um, say, added sugar and has the right combination of uh, sugar, fat, and salt, um, that's going to have an impact at a neurochemical level um, that we can identify with, you know, functional MRI, for example. And if you, as Sharon pointed out, have a certain genetic predisposition or the epigenetics or your environment um, creates the situation where you are then susceptible to, say, a high hedonic response to, you know, that type of food item, that will then drive your craving for consuming the same type of food or foods in that category. So it's not that, you know, the idea of, well, you can't just have one is just, a, you know, 
nice marketing phrase there is a real you know science behind the the propagation of you know consumption um, when it comes to certain types of foods and the neurochemical response that we get so yeah food has an important you know sort of effect on the brain and we're also getting into i guess a third angle could be around cognitive health right so thinking about you know risk for dementia and alzheimer's and understanding the link between insulin resistance and diabetes and and your cognitive health um those are really important areas of discovery as well so yeah the the brain is you know absolutely affected by what we're eating and um we you know have the you know sort of biobehavioral feedback loops that you know really sort of have an impact on how we choose what we eat right and i i'm reminded that um cognitive function was one of the topics that the advisory committee looked at with the for the dietary guidelines and um and and there was some frustration with that because there are a lot of different approaches it's hard to know what really is a validated approach to looking at cognitive function certainly an important area for future dietary guidelines but um, challenging in terms of what what is the research paradigm that that you use yeah uh, yep there was I could say there was an interesting um, publication recently that came out of the PREDICT trial with you know, the personalized nutrition where they showed that if someone's glycemic response would, um, was correlated with their hunger and, and their feelings of satiety. So the, again, this is an area kind of getting into how, how people experience hunger and, and it isn't all in your head. <laughs> you know, we, are, we know a lot about the different satiety hormones, but this was actually, they were, you know, they could model um, how somebody's glycemic response was postprandially to, you know, how hungry they were, both, um, you know, sort of a psychological as well as actual food consumption. So again, there's a lot that I think we can learn from the work that we do in precision nutrition. Right. And so I, there's a question here, and I, I think just the diversity of perspective on the panel has kind of raised it of, you know, where really is the best touch point to intervene? Some people don't want to spend any time in a grocery store. Um, you know, where is that, that sweet spot in terms of um, having people pay more attention to how their choices can affect their health? Allison, it looked like you were uh, <laughs> ready to comment I'm thinking on that. This, yes, this past year, uh, we're, we're definitely seeing food retailers have been extremely agile in meeting the needs of consumers as, you know, the expectations of being in the grocery store shopping versus, you know, shopping virtually has definitely taken a huge shift. Um, so with that, um, the agile ability of the food retailers, uh, the retail dietitians have done the exact same thing in terms of being able to adapt services that were previously provided in store settings to a virtual environment. Um, we're seeing a lot more dietitians enter the e-commerce space and how can dietitians truly start to help customers um, shop and how can we again personalize that shopping experience for them um, in the online shopping space, whether that be for grocery delivery or pickup, um, but still offering that true um, assortment of what Bridget was talking about with medical nutrition therapy um, that can be conducted through telenutrition. So still being able to, you know, provide that expertise, but then it also involves I, I think of a partnership and a team collaboration between what Jamie was talking about with the physicians. You know, is there a partnership opportunity between a variety of healthcare providers so that we truly are providing care coordination amongst all each other um, to really start to take care of the needs, but also progress outcomes. So we're seeing more improvement in outcomes from these situations. Others have a, a comment on that? Agree with that. So go ahead, please, Bridget. That I think e-commerce is the forefront of reaching those who are looking for a more convenient experience. 
And it was highlighted earlier that taste, cost, and convenience are major drivers to human decision-making when it comes to food. So in terms of accessing better nutrition and improving quality of diet, the more we're able to amplify taste, cost, and convenience, while also in the background offering health forward decisions, the more we make healthy decision-making simple without having to facilitate a conscious choice. A good example is we wanted everyone to ride our bikes to work every single day. It wouldn't do us any good if we gave everyone a bike if there was not a bike lane in order to get to work because you can't bike on the highway. So when it comes to facilitating human behavior change, it does have to go beyond the retail environment and beyond e-commerce. We have to make sure that wherever folks access food, we're giving them food in a way that they want to access it to facilitate them actually enjoying the food that will improve their health. Great comment. Um, you're reminding me for another project that I was involved with this last summer. We, we kept coming back to a framework of motivation, opportunity, and ability. And people can have the motivation, but if they don't have the opportunity and the ability, it can be hard to act on that motivation. Or they might start, but then it's hard to sustain their motivation if they don't have the opportunity and ability. So it's looking for that that magic of how those things all, all come to, together. So I, I'm gonna also bring us back, Jamie, you mentioned in yours, you referred to cost in the healthcare system and the, the need for some sort of compensation as this becomes a more of a part of our healthcare model. Um, I think we're hearing about some exciting programs, but Sharon, when you look at all the data involved with personalizing nutrition, that's expensive. You know, Bridget and Allison, when you talk about these retail models, you know, how, how are we dealing with costs across these, these various perspectives? So <clears throat> I think that the way we deliver healthcare um, will continue to evolve. And we will look for different ways to cover the cost of healthcare, moving from the tr traditional fee for service. So right now I get incentivized to see more patients and see them more often, right? Because every time I see someone that's a transaction that gives me credit, right? Whereas ideally what we would be incentivized to do is keep people healthy. Right. And if we could keep someone healthy and demonstrate that we've saved money, we've increased productivity, we've, you know, had some other metric that is on the positive side, then we could share in the saving that's generated. And that could be a community level effort, meaning that facilitates the collaborations across and beyond the four walls of a clinic or a, a health system, right? So the health system has a role, but it's not set up to provide prevention and you know, met, you know, um, prevention of chronic disease per se. It's good at managing acute illness or emergencies, um, stabilizing people. But really, if you're talking about prevention, this is probably not the space. But it could be, could be engaged um, if we can uh, can align incentives in a way that you know I believe facilitates those types of collaborations um, to to provide a, a better, you know, sort of more comprehensive approach to health care provision. That's my, my thought. Others? Yeah, I think that, you know, precision nutrition has grown out of precision medicine, but I'd agree 100% with Jamie that where I think precision or personalized nutrition is in prevention and not you know, we know medical nutrition therapy works. We saw the, the statistics, but I mean, really, I think as nutritionists and physicians, we want to keep our clients and patients from getting sick. And, um, you know, but what I've really been struck and I, I've learned a lot by participating on this panel. And I think that Allison has you know, presented their review, which suggests, you know, some real points of effectiveness and, you know, Bridget, has really shown how you know the dietitians in the in the retail setting 
you know, they really can get granular and very specialized. So, you know, having them as a resource. And I guess I was thinking, Barbara, about what you were saying in terms of how do we, you know, get people to sort of engage and, you know, we're all, I'm having to talk into my phone, but we all have our phones with us all the time and with apps. And I'm thinking about the e-commerce. I mean, linking e-commerce and, and maybe it's out there and I haven't seen it, but, you know, to have a, someone as they're ordering their groceries, you could have them do a quick screening of, you know, what are your nutrition and health goals or who, you know, do you have goals for, you know, you have someone in your house who has celiac disease or whatever, and then, suggestions could be made and then recipes could be offered <laughs> and you know to really have it be and then it can be downloaded on your phone as your shopping list and you know I know recipes online can do that but you know to me this is a real systems-based approach and it's going to take you know what I think dietetics and nutrition have been talking about for so long is you know really prevention and I think the teenagers are the, the place to go you know I'm I'm struck by Reagan Bailey's comments during the VGA that, you know, teenage girls in particular are a train wreck nutritionally. But I also know that, that this that the teenagers in the young 20s that we have today are very interested in the environment, their sustainability. And that seems to be an entree point <laughs> to talk to them about nutrition and diet and what is a healthy diet. And sure, maybe you think you want to be a vegan because you think that's better for the environment. But you know, what about these other nutrients? And so I think that there are ways that we can start to engage them. And that's where we need, as they're getting that independence, you know, to, to teach them to take ownership of their health and, and move forward. And they're very techy. So it's, you know, this is the way I think that we need to go is, is to use technology in, in smart ways. And I would build from that. I, I think where Jamie and Sharon were going to, uh, it, it comes down to sustainable funding sources for prevention um, of health and well-being services. We've established reimbursement opportunities and incentives um, for disease management and treatment. And even in the food insecurity space uh, with, you know, the reimbursement and the payment for even medically tailored meals are, are making great strides with the community-based organizations truly hitting the ground running with these efforts. Um, where Where can we start to build stronger efforts towards uh, sustainable funding and reimbursement for these prevention type services, I think could make great leaps in being able to expand these services even further. Bridget, were you yeah. gonna comment? I liked Alton's point about medically tailored meals and the reimbursement in that space, because the thought around reimbursement right now is centered around sick care, not preventative care. So it's important to give folks access to nutrition education from a prevention standpoint, but that's kind of tell me how to eat. The idea of also simultaneously reimbursing medical nutrition therapy and medically tailored meals allows tell me how to eat, teach me how to cook, provide me what to eat, and it basically closes the gap on convenience that we referenced earlier. Yeah, I'm going to come in in this space, too, because I know we had one question about how does personalized nutrition and sort of what we're talking about, this food as medicine concept, how, where do you see retail packaged foods playing a role? And, and that comes back to this dichotomy we have between conventional food, where the claim structure on conventional food is not intended to treat, cure, mitigate disease, prevent disease. Whereas as we move into some of the areas that Bridget's been talking about, and Allison, you've been talking about, what is the structure that validates those claims in a way that um, they can be relied on by the public? I think A&D is creating that model of how do you become um, the sort of organization that validates the claims, but it, it it's a challenge right now because that's not the way we think of conventional foods that moves it into the food for special dietary use or the medical food category. So um, actually we're, we're getting near the 
end of our time. So I think rather than try to launch into another question here, um, I'm going to just, I want to give each of you at least a minute to be able to say whatever the last soundbite is that uh, you want people to remember from the presentation. So I'm going to just go in the order that the presentations were, were given. So Allison, that means I start with you. I, I think for me, it's going to come down to the, the individuals and truly meeting the health needs of the individuals. Um, and, and, and even what we do within retail and how, you know, consumers are driving these health and well-being trends. So how do we connect the science um, to food um, through research so that we can help communicate those messages the most clearly um, to really drive this train forward. Sharon? Yeah, you know, I would ag agree with Allison's comments. And, you know, what I think the science is moving. And I think that the, the NIH, you know, Nutrition for Precision Health Consortium is going to provide data on a large number of much more um, diverse individuals, and that will help. Um, but I think that we can start to do things now, and I think that we shouldn't be waiting. You know, we should be following that science, promoting that science, but I, I think that we need to start thinking about how do we communicate what we know? And, you know, I talked to a lot of companies, and, you know, they're, they're all poised. So they want to get into this space, but they're not quite sure how to do it. Um, but so I think it's continuing to talk with professional societies, continuing to talk with with the academics and the physicians and the researchers and think about how your products or your companies can, you know, begin to, and I understand, Carl, you can't really market it, but, you know, to position products, um, you know, that would be in a healthier space. And that would be, you know, sort of building upon this idea of personalized health. And, and then, you know, be poised and watching the science as it as is emerging. Great. Thanks. Jamie? So I think I would leave a, a couple of thoughts uh, for the audience. Um, one is we'd need to advocate for more um, nutrition education and medical training. Um, it, there's there's a, a woeful lack of that. And I think if we want healthcare providers, uh, practitioners to be on the team that's a part of this, you know, idea of, of integrating nutrition into health management in a in a way that um, expands what we're currently doing. And we, we need to give that workforce the tools and education to be able to competently participate in that. Um, and I think there are lots of potential opportunities, especially as we develop more on the health technology side and, and are thinking about those biomarkers that are really, you know, potentially going to be crucial in terms of determining prescriptions or understanding interactions and uh, predictors of outcomes. So I think those are really, you know, sort of important areas for us to think about and invest in. And Bridget. Regardless of the sector you work in, whether it's food safety, policy and advocacy, research, the medical aspect, food manufacturers, we all hold a duty to consumers to simplify healthier eating and make it as frictionless as possible to engage in behavior that improves long-term health outcomes. Because to date, consumers perceive health as something that tastes bad, is expensive, and is very hard to do. We need to remember that there is a person in personalized nutrition, and those people need our help, and they want it to be simple. We have the opportunity to make them engage in healthier behavior if we can make it easy. Great. Thanks. Um, well, that brings an end to our session, and um, thank you so much to each of you. The, the different perspectives, I think, have really been valuable in, in helping us think about where the opportunity is in, in this area. And so with that, we will close our session.